So, so you have a job. No, but and and, and we we also need Amy. Last, the steering committee last night decided we're trying out the term easel weasel, but you know we're not sure if it's going to catch on or not. Um, so. If you looked at the agenda for tomorrow, you will have seen that we have a keynote talk in the morning. And then there's some times in there, but there's actually a lot of blank space. Um, because I, the goal is to find resonances, to find ideas around which there's energy, um, opportunities for collaboration. I will just, as an aside, say that clearly one of the potential, we hope, outcomes of this, and I, and I speak this not in an official sense, but just in the sense of any time you get a group of people together to share ideas, um, it, one of the things that, that potentially can happen is that you individually simply hear a good idea that is something that that society over there is doing, and you can see how that could work in your society. That's a potential outcome. Um, we hope you're going to run with those. I hope you're going to run. i got to be careful here. I can't speak for the National Academy on this. I hope you're going to run with those. Um, but what we want to do tomorrow is also try to explore this space of where are the synergies, where are the potential partnerships, where are the potential collaborations. Um, the, the session is called a collaboration session. That's a, that's a clue that it, that's really the direction. And so what we're going to do now is um, it, it's not a free-for-all. We're not going to try to get you back in groups. We're not going to try to get groups to build consensus around what they thought their best ideas were. You've had a chance to hear a lot of ideas, both from this morning and from this afternoon. Um, and so now the question in front of you is, what topics do you want to run with? Where in this case, run with means spend time tomorrow digging into them more deeply, understanding them more, potentially figuring out what kind of partnerships and collaborations or what would the steps be towards running with these ideas. Um, and also, um, in spite of all the conversation we've had, are there really important topics that live in this space of engineering societies that would, could have a bearing on engineering undergraduate education that just somehow or other um, never came up? And so those are the, those are the points to this. Um, so what's going to happen is some, we're gonna, I'm going to ask for people to, to volunteer ideas. Ken has a, a roaming mic, or you can walk to one of the side mics. Um, and Carl has a roaming mic too. We've got each side. We've got we we got multiple roaming mics, and we have fixed mics on either edge of the room. Um, it, we'll see if this works. I'm actually going to start with a completely unstructured. Eventually, we're going to come back, and I'm going to remind you what the four breakouts were this morning and what the four breakouts were this afternoon, just so that um, if having a, a, a reminder, a ping, um, helps provide some structure to this. But I, I, I'm, I want to start. Could I make just one quick point? Yeah. After we compile all these ideas, we're going to ask you to vote. Yeah. I'm getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So Albert and Amy are NAE fellows, and I think on the job for a week. Is that right? Not, for, not very long at all. So this is one of their first immersion experiences, uh, but they, they are going to be capturing the ideas that they hear. Um, and then we're going to vote. You're going to have dots, they're green. Are they all green? Oh no, multicolored dots, but the, the colors don't mean anything. Um, you're going to have dots, you're going to vote. Um, the goal is to shape tomorrow morning's agenda for the collaboration sessions that follow the plenary. Um, and so the, what the, 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 while you are all on your own for dinner tonight and hope that you will take advantage of using it to keep 
connections going and keep conversations going. The steering committee is going to be hunkered down, um, making sense out of this to, to put together an agenda for tomorrow. And so the question are ideas that you want to run with, that you want to dig into, that you want to continue, or ideas that didn't come up at all. I'm going to start with a just open the top of mind. It could be an idea from your group. It could be an idea you heard from another group. And then we're going to come back and circle back and add a little bit of structure just to make sure that we're not actually forgetting something. And and I got to warn everybody here. No, I got one more thing to say. Um, this is the kind of session where the boldest, you know, it, it has the risk of those people who say, yeah, I'm going to raise my hand and, you know, this. Everybody in here has good ideas and good thoughts on this, and I'm going to keep working to make sure that um, it's not just who raised their hand first. We're going to try to make sure. So, But please take it on yourself. If you heard something compelling, um, and, and the great thing is you can be complimenting somebody else's idea if it wasn't your own, um, say that you would like to put that on the list to be considered tomorrow. Okay. I'd like to uh, explore further the idea of a joint society competition or challenge. Something we haven't talked about at all yet are those activities that societies, academia, and industry takes with students before they've entered their undergraduate experience. This conversation is focused towards engineering education. And when you talk about engineering education as one voice, right now, ASEE, right or wrong, I think I'm correct in saying that is the only voice that can say that we speak for engineering education. We talked in one of the uh, breakout groups about some joint membership, joint collaboration of a sort by having multiple organizations becoming members. So even though organizations like IEEE, ASME, ASC have very large membership, but not all of the members are engaged in engineering education. Therefore, I would like to suggest and propose that we look at finding some ways of expanding the pool of individuals who are involved in engineering education, and we can thereby, when we come up with a position statement and so on, we can say, that 50,000 or 100,000 individuals across the country who are involved in engineering education are speaking with one voice. And if you think you're going to want to talk, raise your hand, because that way the microphone can be finding you. There's Ken over there. OK. Was there someone over here? It's like a roundup of best practices. So as a, as a collective group, a way to figure out what the best practices are. Hands? Yep. It, it, it's OK. We'll get. One of the things that came out in our group was a methodology to make sure that underrepresentation increases through uh, integrating the professional societies through the affinity organizations like NSBE, WePAN, NAMIPA, because a lot of our members don't know the benefits. So how do we make sure we're routing uh, some of this information through those groups? Okay. Eric, I think. So a a tremendous amount of engineering work, of course, is done in these engineering societies. As I may have said earlier, at just my school, we have Baja Club, Robotics Club, Rocket Club, 3D Printing Club, HVAC Club, et cetera, et cetera. And the students and the faculty are really highly engaged throughout the year in these activities. Everybody knows the benefit. Is there any way that we can work to get more formal credit for both parties, more formal credit for the students in terms of credit towards their engineering degree in some way, and more formal credit 
for the faculty in recognition of this being a teaching activity that takes quite a bit of bandwidth. Yeah, two things. I tend to look for places that we had the most difficult time wrestling with, but those are more productive. Uh, two that I got down. One was the issue of aiding faculty in taking industry internships or gaining industry understanding. That's, that's awkward. That's a problem. How do we do that? We know it's important. Uh, the other thing was this last topic our breakout group was, uh, how do we aid the education process by dealing with uh, professional policies, but especially public policies? How do we use that? I mean, it's, we were we felt awkward about it, but we felt it was important to bring up. Okay, so I think that that's a good segue. Does somebody have a mic that's waiting to speak? No, I mean I'm not asking for new, new I'm not asking for new distribution. I'm saying, does anybody have the mic and their hand was up and they have the mic? Because I'm going to do a slight segue off of that. Okay. Um, okay. Go ahead. Uh, a disclaimer, I don't know if it matters, I'm a staff member at the NAE, so I'm not a society member, just to be clear. You're not a member of any society? Oh, I am. I'm a member of a society, but I'm not representing any societies. <laughs> um, my thought was um, that it could be useful for the societies to have an effort to uh, collect wisdom on uh, best practices or good practices in education research and evaluation and that that information be shared to inform all of these efforts from the beginning or in conception stage through the end. As we know from what you said at the beginning in the survey work and the literature review, there's not a lot there. And education research is, is difficult, but I think it could be quite useful to have a, a core group of experts across the societies work together to help all the societies in this regard. Okay. I'm going to do a, a little bit of a pivot because no, I'm pivoting. I'm, I'm, I'm pivoting at this point. It, it may still be relevant, but I just, I, I, I wanted to start with an opportunity to just free flow of ideas, which included, in some ways, reformulations or different formulations or things that pinged off of things we heard earlier today. But we also did have eight breakouts, lightning round sessions around topics and breakouts around those. And I don't want to lose sight of the ideas that came out of those. And so I, I now want to turn, well, we're going to come back to the more free form, but I want to turn for, for a little bit of time here. We're, I'm going to go through the, the breakout topics one by one. Um, I, I initially will say, for if you were in that breakout, the question is, was there a standout idea that came out of your session that you want to put forward? I'm not asking the groups to rearrange and reconvene and figure out that you all agree on one, I'm, but I am asking you to be thoughtful about what's, what's the standout topic that, that you talked about either this morning in the breakout or this afternoon in the breakout that you would like to have on this list for consideration to run with tomorrow. And so we're going to, we're simply going to go back and do this in order. The, the topics from this morning were the what do we do topics. And the first one was developing partnerships for innovation in education, um, student chapters and beyond. So from that group one, the group that was in here this morning, um, a standout idea that you would like to suggest we run one. And it can come from any one of the members of the group. It could also come from somebody who was just listening and said, that's the idea. That's what we got to do. But um, it was a long time ago. I know. I think in a minimum, whoever did the breakout report got to have a, has to have at least one or two of those ideas in their head. We're going to narrow this down even more. Okay, Tazos. Oh. One idea that came out is for the American Society for Engineering Education to have a, a, a committee. And since I suggested that, let me explain what I meant by that. A committee to do what? To look at educating the engineer of 2035 and 2040 and beyond. What are the traits of the engineer of the future? This is an exercise we have done in the past. 
But uh, the question is that a lot of times I, I go back and we still teach the same way we taught 30 years ago. So uh, American Shadow Engineering can kind of the leadership and say, okay, what are we doing? So, uh, yeah, all the other things we have discussed, K-12 and all the other co-curriculum activities. How about the curriculum? Like my, my thinking when I pro suggest that that is the curriculum. Are we missing something as far as have the fundamentals of engineering are changing, have changed, or how do we educate the engineers the fundamentals? Maybe it's, it's both the content and the technique. Is there something basic there that we're missing? And it has to be done, that force has to include educators and industry because a partnership. They just hire their students, the best ones to answer, you know, what are the students are missing, if anything. Or if everybody is doing a great job, we give ourselves a pat in the back and go home. Okay. There an, is there another idea from Group 1 this morning? I, I mentioned this not because I spoke about it, but because it was mentioned again in a different group. But it would simply be the issue of how do we better integrate uh, standards uh, standards education within the engine, all of the engineering curricula. Okay, moving on to group two from this morning, promoting diversity. Killer ideas from the, the promoting diversity group. I don't remember what room you were in, I'm sorry. <coughs> One oh six. Okay, one oh three. Got it. Anne was your facilitator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand the group did not talk about the 50,000, but it, we've had reported today that that's something that's working in a very collaborative way. Why don't we do some in-depth analysis of that particular event and everything around it to determine some best practices from that? So uh, say that this this um, group of, of organizations that are here today get behind that fifty thousand and promote it through our societies, through our websites, through other areas. Okay. Yeah. So in this theme, as a person that does a lot of faculty hiring, uh, one of our challenges ought to be to pick a big number like we're, what, 20% women faculty, something like that. That might be a stretch. Should we have a stretch goal to get to 35 or 40% women faculty? I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in the numbers per se or, you know, because you get into a horrible, silly set of discussions. But let's set a big goal for significantly increasing women and underrepresented minority faculty. Years ago, the advanced program at Rice had that wonderful database that department chairs could tap into to get ideas because let's face it, most search committees self-replicate. We gotta get away from self-replication. So there, there should be a big idea out there to facilitate via data repositories and society support to kind of push this forward. Just to go along with that, uh, NSF's advanced programs have done an awful lot on recruitment and retention of women faculty. So that'd be something to tap into as well. Okay. The, the third group this morning in room 105, I found my notes, um, fostering interdisciplinary engineering education. Ideas, top ideas from that group to, to take forward to consider for tomorrow. Uh, one we already listed, with, with, which is the uh, joint society competition, but another one was how you uh, incorporate societal issues, grand challenge issues into capstone design, 
or other types of uh, school projects or classwork. Yes, Harry. Ken. Another one that stood out was giving people the opportunity to essentially cross-train, the idea that you might have an engineering person doing the finance or a finance person doing the logistics of a group and, and so on, that if this might be a way to um, broaden the abilities of students who go through these programs. Okay, and then the fourth group from this morning was raising awareness of engineering disciplines. Okay. So it really started to build on the 50K experience, which was really to start working in these um, larger efforts, such as through ASEE or AAES, and working more towards the collective impact or the coalition approaches rather than the individual onesie twosie approaches. And that way, it'd be easier to share best practices, get the word out, and identify broad partnerships instead of the smaller, smaller partnerships where it's hard to really tell the story. Okay. Yes, Abby. One of the things that came out of our discussions was the need to do a better job marketing engineering as a profession to the general public. And so one of the suggestions was to form an umbrella group of professional societies to put together another group that would look at marketing of engineering as a profession to the public using mainstream media. Uh, far, far back corner. Just, uh, my colleague at Embry Riddle a tip on this one, but um, I think Charlie, your words were an NCAA like uh, construct. So uh, I think that's a good, useful analogy. I didn't want to let it drop off the table. Okay, we're ready to move to this afternoon. I know it was after lunch, and so there's this whole other thing that goes on with what happens with brains after lunch, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, the group that was in this room right after lunch, establishing effective inter-society collaborations, um, ideas to run with from that topic. Okay. I'm seeing some of the people participating over and over, and I'm not going to stop them, but I'm really looking to some of the rest of you to, to get those hands up. One of the ideas was to create a kind of a, uh, uh, a central hub or portal where we can access all the information about what societies are doing and best practices and so on. Um, one of the things we discussed was I mean, repeatedly was the lack of cooperation because of lack of continuity uh, between different societies. And that every time an initiative is taken on, uh, that the initiative fizzles out when people change. So the idea was to have more well-defined, smaller efforts, which when they lead to success, you can scale higher, but not to start with something very big. And the real key thing was to get different societies to work together. The commitment has got to come from the top. It cannot happen with the technical people. And so there was a general feeling that the NAE might be able to play some sort of a role in trying to facilitate that cooperation. And I'm going to tell our two easel people that if you need to tear that sheet off and go to another one, that's okay too. Um, it's okay. Second topic from this afternoon, bolstering society university collaboration. Hi, uh, we talked a lot about uh, motivation in, in all three groups, students, faculty, and, and the societies themselves. And, and the motivation for the students and the societies seemed pretty obvious, but the faculty motivation to 
uh, work on this collaboration was a little lacking. And, and that kind of comes from the top when you're working for tenure. Um, you know, it's not really taken into consideration. And so the, it was brought up that uh, the societies maybe come together to try to lobby uh, for something that matters to the universities, like the U.S. Uh, news report rankings, uh, to get that as a factor in the in those rankings um, to really motivate the schools to um, to put that as a priority uh, because once the faculty gets involved the students um, have a continuing uh, motivation to to get involved there the student uh, turnover rate is much higher but if you get the faculty involved that way uh, I think that's a really good idea and I'm going to um, really, it's, really, it's societies lobbying for a change in the, the engineering school rankings to get the society collaboration okay. involved in those rankings. Okay. Um, anything? Okay. We're still on society university collaboration. <laughs> One of the other things we talked about a good bit was the role of professional societies in a couple of examples, ASE and, a and ASWE, in training, um, training instructors, training new faculty for their instructional task. Um, professional societies have a unique role in that they have the potential to impact all three areas of a typical faculty member's professional life in research service as well as in teaching. And as such, it seems like that would be there would be a lot of potential for professional societies to play an active role in dissemination of um, of research-based best practices in engineering education, as well as as resources for innovative approaches in engineering education. Okay. Yep. Jack. Karen. Uh, okay, over here. Uh, on the previous point, uh, I like to propose that actually we look at it a little bit more holistically by the fact of when you look at the NSF, NSF funded a lot of projects for curriculum change, flip classrooms, and everything else. But culturally, when we get to the university, we are still using the same tenure uh, promotion criteria that we were using about 20 years ago. And sometimes if you do quote unquote education research, that is not serious research. I had a conversation and I say, write a proposal. If you get accepted, then I can ag agree with you because that's as competitive as your basic research. So I think what we need to look at is, I'm going back to the previous uh, point of potentially looking at changing the system holistically, which include promotion and tenure, in hiring of the faculty, and so on and so forth, in order to revolutionize the engineering education. Okay. We need to talk about engineering education research. We've got some counterexamples. Um, yeah. one okay, back. Karen, and then we're going to move on. We talked about looking not just at faculty training, but we said that societies have the best practices for professional development, for teaching ethics, and for, the, for also under, um, inclusion of uh, gender bias, teaching about gender bias, or inclusion of underrepresented individuals, and ha adapting, adopting those practices within the curriculum itself or within the institution so that those are used rather than the universities trying to keep reinventing the wheel to do their own incorporation of ethics in their programs. Um, third breakout this afternoon, using societies to facilitate academia industry alignment. Key ideas. We were talking about perhaps in leveraging the vibrant industry university networks that are in the IUCRCs and using them for innovations in undergraduate education. Right now, that I don't think is a big charge for the centers right now, but perhaps the broader impact uh, aspect of NSF could be uh, used for this. Amy, do you, do you get that or do you need? For undergraduate education, yeah. Yeah, uh, leveraging the network already, the existing. Okay. 
Anything else under the societies to facilitate academia industry alignment? And then finally, societies and informal learning. We talked a bit about how uh, mentor mentorship works for uh, traditionally disadvantaged populations, so trying to figure out how we can um, scale that to reach more of the of, of people in, within those populations. Okay, and there's a hand back. Can I add to that? We also talked about um, offering some kind of training or developing training for undergraduate students to work with each other. Um, faculty to work with undergraduate students to sort of really come in and having the professional societies as well being involved in that, that there's a, there seems to be a true absence of training for how to interact with each other to create a really inclusive environment. I just want to make sure that Albert got that last one. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go one more quick round because we got to start voting. Um, so that was structured based on what ideas that jogged in your memories from earlier today or just thinking back about this whole potential portfolio. Are there any other ideas, topics that people would like to have on the list for consideration? Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, Donna Nelson, University of Oklahoma and American Chemical Society. Um, one thing that was briefly touched on but not discussed a great deal is the public perception of science and, and engineers, scientists and engineers, and uh, what we can do to um, improve that because that does impact students who are deciding whether to go into science and engineering or not. And there are a number of things that impact that. The one thing that comes to my mind most recently is this new report that's come out of Congress, this Porky Mon Go. What can we do about that? I'm looking around for Don Giddens. Oh, there you are. I was looking to see where you were because I did. I, 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 it has, there have been enough times during the day today where things have come up that touch on the changing the conversation, messages for improving public understanding of engineering, seemed like it should be part of the conversation. I just want to give a shout out to John, who chaired the NAE committee um, in 2008, um, something like that. Um, I, I have cited it enough times that I know the date. It's 2000, but but this is also something that uh, when we think about not forgetting what's happened in the past, this is one that if if anybody hasn't read it, you should read it. Sorry, the title of the IMAX movie includes dreams in it, and you recall that the tagline that was most favored in our report was because dreams need doing. And that may have had no connection at all with the name of your of your video, but it was good to hear that yeah. the, the whole title of the report was changing the conversation it was, it, and change the way we talk about things and that dreams got into it. It was nice to hear. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, we talk about the uh, we. I've heard in in one of our groups, and though it wasn't in the formal group, about uh, internships and and the value of internships uh, for students to really to understand um, how to become much more purposeful students after seeing the linkages between um, what they're learning in the classroom and obviously what's what's in industry. Um, so that's that's something. But uh, one of the topics I'd love to raise is 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 funding, um, sources of funding for many of these initiatives, at a at a level that we're 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 not cannibalizing each other uh, in these efforts. Many of us are going after the same companies, the same the same uh, foundations, the same federal agencies, et cetera, for, the, for a lot of similar work. And how can we really get to scale? The example that I bring often is, is Frederick Patterson in 1944, the president of 
Hampton Institute uh, now, I'm sorry, Tuskegee Institute now, of course, Tuskegee University, formed the United Negro College Fundraising Organization. And since that time, in 1944, they raised $4 billion and, uh, and helped uh, 400,000 young people get to college. So how can we get to a scale of funding so that we're not cannibalizing each other, uh, but we're really expanding the pie in order to have a, a, tr a transformative impact on the numbers? Okay, and and although it wasn't what Carl initially meant to see, say, but since he mentioned Hampton Institute, if you have not seen and read Hidden Figures, you really need to do this. I'm just putting that out there. Um, the the one thing that that's been particularly of great importance to me, and I've been very interested in, is the Grand Challenges Program. And when you look at what the NAE has done in terms of its outreach in terms of the videos, in terms of the documentation, and to get over 120 academic institutions committed to creating Grand Challenge Scholars, and he had to have done something really right. And I'd like to see how that model can be used to reach out to professional societies to get them to work with these Grand Challenge institutions so that their student clubs, their student organizations, are also focused on the interdisciplinary type of work that is necessary for the Grand Challenges program. Okay. Saw a hand here looking for a mic, okay, so, okay, yes. This is from one of the breakout groups, I wasn't sure if it was captured yet, the co-op in industry for faculty who don't have industry experience. Greg. So, so I've been sitting and really trying to take in what I've been hearing said, and there are a couple of things that kind of bubble up, and they lead me to think that we need a a significant approach and a uh, a major change in the way in which uh, you know, and an a inst an institutional reform like framework based on the way in which we evaluate faculty for promotion and tenure. And the, ra the rationale is that these values, the kinds of things we're putting forward here today, don't seem to me, at least, to be in alignment mm -hmm. with the way in which faculty are rewarded and promoted. And um, there, will always be, there will always be this disconnect. And uh, if you look at it, uh, at Research One institutions, the individuals who are promoting and propagating and moving these efforts forward oftentimes are not your, uh, what we would consider your most successful faculty. And so there is, an, there is indeed a disconnect there. I think if we want to promote an institutional reform framework, we had the NSF folks here, uh, at least earlier today, but if we want to promote an institutional, uh, a real revolutionary change, that that change has to be in the standard by which uh, we promote and tenure. Yep, Jenna. So, uh, Greg, I'm trying to sit here and sort of uh, think about all these things. So, just kind of playing off Carl's idea about. Think about large problems that we collaborate on. A couple of things that I think resonate with me, and I've heard people mention things like the 50K Coalition or the Grand Challenges for Engineering. Um, I'm on the steering committee for the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, so I have an affinity for that. But uh, you know, perhaps one thing to do is to think about several of these large issues. Could be the tenure and promotion criteria issue, but think about several cross-cutting issues that as a group, we as a group of entering societies should come together and tackle. Uh, there are large problems, no society could tackle those by themselves, but we could each claim kind of our corner of the turf, if we will. That would be a way to take our collective impact, we've talked about that today, and do something that is not reinventing the wheel all the time and that we could not do by ourselves. Last pass, Dom. 
Uh, just a quick comment to think ahead about the regional meetings is not unre- not directly related to the breakout groups, but how how will we effectively engage to get student input to this whole project at the regional meetings? What's an effective way to do that? And that's certainly something we will have to think about regardless. Yeah. Okay. Yep. John. Yeah, I just I want to come back to one point and really just sort of ask the question, and it's a point that Anastasio brought up, but it's something that we're even facing inside the academy, and that is how do you recognize the evolution of the engineering disciplines, not just the emerging technologies, but how the disciplines are evolving, and I don't think that the, uh, the academia or industry or the societies, e- either any of them has a complete vision of that, but together, it would be very helpful to be thinking about, you know, how are technologies evolving? We talked a lot about getting sort of social consciousness into engineering, but, you know, you still got to be able to design a strut that doesn't break. So it's, uh, so it's somehow it's a combination of all of the above. But I, I wonder that, you know, in this forum or between academia and and the societies, is there a way to begin to – really sort of recognize what's happening. You know, we've got ASME's got 2030, and, you know, people are trying to look out there. But it's something that we're even facing with the membership uh, membership policies inside the National Academy. How do you identify emerging technologies and do it in a way that you're, you know, people are established in them? And so it's, a, it's quite an interesting dilemma, I think. But it's something that, that needs to be done. And I don't know if that really fits in this context or not, but it's come to mind for me, and people have articulated it off and on during the day. So I wonder if that's one of the things we ought to be thinking about. Okay, Kathy. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Cody Verhalen. I'm the president of the National Society of Professional Engineers. And on that same note, um, this year NSPE has launched a Future of the Profession Task Force, working with NCWS and our members, including some who are involved in higher education as well as technicians and technologists to evaluate the, the future of the profession, specifically as it relates to NSP of professional engineering, but incorporating the technology, the education, the public messaging, the public understanding of engineers, and how the grand bargain between society and the licensed professions overall are changing, and the expectations are changing and evolving over time, and how we can respond to those from an engineering perspective. Okay. Kathy? I, I think that, um, as John said, we are missing the student voice, but they are telling us what they want. In the engineering, we had a workshop a couple years ago, engineering education, where we had students there, and this is the workshop that 120 universities did sign on mm-hmm. to uh, commit to graduating students that met the um, grand challenges and the Millennium Development Goals, but the students are very much pushing for this um, kind of renaissance of the engineering education to kind of change. They're demanding it. We're behind the curve. So they're actually pushing for this, and they're pushing for it in a very loud way. And So what you're seeing is you're seeing groups like EWB take off and soar. You're seeing other nonprofits taking off, and we're going to get left behind pretty quickly. So I, I think you're seeing it because they're doing other alternative things while they're waiting for us to move forward. So their voice is out there, but they're just talking to other people at this point. And I think from a bullet's point of view, that's reinforcing previous. Okay, we need to catch up. Um, Last call, ideas that are not yet on the list it should be. Okay. I just just one quick point. When you do vote, if you look at reading through those, that you find something that doesn't quite fit, feel free. We'll have a blank sheet as well that you can add idea. You can actually write ideas on. So. People get that. Yeah, we we have got to look at both sides. Yeah, that's both both sides so that if 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 it didn't quite capture what you thought it 
thought it should have captured, you you can go ahead and write the correction on it. Okay, so you have three dots. That tells you how many times you can vote. Um, you can place all your bets on one topic. You can spread them around. Um, obviously, we're not going to get to all of these. And so what's, what's going to happen after you vote is we're going to take all this. The steering committee is um, going to work on this this evening. Um, the, the goal is going to be to then define the collaboration sessions. There are, there are two of them. So we have the capacity for eight structured discussions tomorrow. If it looks like by merging things that's spreading too thin, we will, we will use our best judgment to do that. We're also going to um, provide, we haven't figured out how yet, but we are going to provide the, the capability to say there are other ideas that we're not going to dig into more deeply tomorrow, but Obviously, there were multiple people who wanted to participate in those, and we will be working out a mechanism to help you connect with each other um, outside the, the formal sessions tomorrow morning, because that's also an important part of this. Leo, is making can count everybody here and multiply by three to be sure there's no voter fraud that's going to occur. <laughs> <laughs> I am taking the given that there's going to be actually the way fraud, and I'm gonna the, the, the way the vote the, the way I'm the voting works there. is cumulative. I'm not going there. <laughs> Just to clarify that. Wait, John, what you don't know is that I lived in Chicago for a couple of years, and so this is a very sensitive topic. <laughs> Leah, let me clear. Can I clarify that for half a second? The the idea here is that the, the voting is cumulative, so you can in fact use all three of your dots on one topic. If that's if that's the one topic that you are absolutely positively passionate about, you can put all three dots on one topic. No, no, they were divided. There was some of it, half, right but half. the idea was to, yeah, the try was Albert get this side and Amy would get this if, side. All right. There is some duplication. So, so what I got to okay, what I got to say is, if there is duplication, you're going to have to trust us to realize that it's there and add up the two dot the two dot counts. <laughs> You're gonna okay. Procedure. You're gonna have to take. You've been listening, so you may already know pretty well which of those ideas really were jumping out at you that you would really like to say. There's huge opportunity here to create to either amplify existing impact, create new impact, do things that that leverage this group in in new ways, new scales. Um, but the ideas are there, so you can either. Zoom to where you think that idea was written down, and roughly it is of this half, that half from the scribing. But take your time, read the topics, do your votes. This says that we have 15 minutes budgeted for final comments. It's not going to take 15 minutes. So um, I'm, I'm guessing we can budget 20, 25 minutes to go through this process. Take your time and vote, because the wrap-up, I think, is going to be pretty easy. We've got to do some logistics, but I think we've pretty much said what's happening tomorrow. So. Now's your chance. Ah, great. Um, and, and just for clarity, I, I broke down like all of the feedback into what I defined as 13 different categories. There is, of course, overlap between them, um, but I tried to make it easier so you have buckets to vote on. So look on all of them, on all sides. Um, so if I miss something or you think something should be broken out into its own group, there is a new ideas one. So feel free to break it out. And please avoid uh, any spelling mistakes. So. You always hurt cats, don't you? <laughs> my life. <laughs> Except for my trunk being a family, which is actually not. I mean, it's like, oh, it's like, it's like, it's like, one final thing, if anybody needs taxis, please sign up now. Let me think about it a little. I mean, everybody's saying, what are you doing? I have to. 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 I have to
mean, I hear I heard that at my age with my own kids. So one of them is actually going to be an engineer. And the guy in physics now. I was going up there about once a month and pulling out, you know, taking her out to the cafeteria and saying, wow. voting. Okay. This is, this is, it says here, final comments. We're, we're up to the final comments. We're at, well, we're ahead of schedule. What do you know? Um, <laughs> I'm going to just, I, my, my final comments, my, my final comments are, um, I think it's twofold, but I reserve the right to have it be three. Um, the first is thank you all. I mean, the 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 quality of discussion, the the energy um, is really wonderful. So thank you. Um, point number two is keep it up because we're not done, um, and so we will be back here tomorrow. And point number three is just a reminder about the timing for tomorrow. Um, the Continental Breakfast will be out starting at around 8, but the session will start at 8.30. The reason we keep saying this over and over again is because it's a half hour earlier than it was today. Um, so 8.30 start, and we're going to be starting um, with just very brief, we're going to be announcing what tomorrow's agenda is since you know we keep pointing out we don't have one so in that opening session we'll be announcing this is the agenda and also the logistics for um, 
how for those things that aren't on the agenda to, have to facilitate connections among people who are interested in specific topics. And then at 845, keynote, State of Engineering Education. Um, Dan Moat, President of the National Academy of Engineering, will be here um, to give welcome and to introduce the keynote speaker, who's Daryl Pines. He's the dean. And um, Nariman Far. Varden Professor of Aerospace Engineering um, at the University of Maryland. And then we're going to be going into the collaboration sessions tomorrow. This is the deeper dive. This is what, you know, okay, how do we turn this into an action agenda? What's going to happen next? So those are my three announcements. Thank you for today. Um, stay energized for tomorrow and be here um, with or without food, ready to, to, ready to roll at 830. And, and I'm going to look at Ken. Is there anything else? We're set? We're good? Okay. Thank you all. Have a good evening.